All right, hi everybody. We've got another uh, edition of the Spotlight Series with Baseball Miracles, a nonprofit organization designed to serve the underserved youth across the world through the beautiful game of baseball and softball. And, and today I am very delighted to be joined by a former big leaguer and uh, a contributor to Baseball Miracles. It is Willie Frazier. Willie, thanks so much for taking some time out of your schedule to speak with us today. It is, uh, it's grateful to have you on. It's my pleasure to be here. I appreciate you asking. So let's get let's get started with the the question that I always ask a lot of of people that come on here, and that is, how did you find out about baseball miracles? Well, um, being from Newburgh and John Timini was from Newburgh as well, and I didn't know John um, at all. It was my father that knew John, and um, before I, I was already playing, and my and my dad had asked me if I knew John Timinia, and I said, no, I don't, I don't recognize the name. So when I finally met John, which was six years ago, maybe, he had talked to me about Baseball Miracles. So um, it was intriguing to me. I, I thought, uh, what a great concept of, of, you know, bringing the game everywhere. You know, I mean, I was fortunate enough to play in five different countries. So to get it out there like that, and then I saw it like, at its peak in Japan, how nuts they were for it. I mean, and then, and, you know, and hopefully it just continues to grow from there. Yeah, no doubt. And so, so it was six years ago that you first met John in person, right? Correct. Where, yes. where was that? Binghamton, the uh, double A game. I walked into the ballpark and I sat down and I didn't know John. Um, I know of him, but I didn't know him. And he, um, he came up and introduced himself to me and said, um, he asked me how my father was doing. Um, and I had told him he had passed, but he said, um, he goes, we used to talk a lot after you were already drafted and gone. Um, Cause my dad would just go and watch the games and, and, you know, the kid in the area. So, uh, cool. They, they had a relationship. I knew they did, but I didn't know it was as much as it was when John was telling me. So it was great. That's awesome. What, what type of, I guess, relationship did, did John share with you that he had with your dad? What was the relationship? It like? was, um, it was more of a, like every time they were at the ballpark, they would seek each other out type of thing just to sit and talk and just to see how things are going and bounce things off. I mean, I don't think they called each other on the phone too often, but, um, but you know, if there was a game in the area, my father was probably going to be at it. And then, um, you know, and John would be at it, I'm sure. So I, I didn't, it was crazy because I was playing and I had no idea when John kind of filled me in the whole time. I was like, are you kidding? Really? He goes, yeah, I used to hang out with your dad all the time. I was like, that's crazy. So it was awesome. That's, that's tremendous. And, and so now you've uh, you know, you, you've shown your support through uh, our organization, baseball miracles. You've been uh, very, very helpful. And, and, you know, you're, your name certainly uh, rings everybody's ears uh, around the organization. I must say, now, you actually told me before we just started this that you were a part of the, the Newberg Clinic, right? That was a couple of years ago. Can you just tell me what you remember about that experience? Sure. Um, I remember a lot about that because it was a great experience. Uh, you know, you start out with the kids and, and they're unsure and they're not confident. Some of them, half of them are not confident. Some of them really have never really played at all. And... I just remember spending time with the kids and watching the instructors and being a part of that. And by the end, the confidence and the happiness these kids had just by playing catch and hitting a ball and running around, it was like, it, it's what the game should be about in my mind and in, in my eyes. And, you know, we lose sight of that sometimes, I think, at the pro level. But um, just to see the joy in these kids' faces was really, really cool. What a when you are able to go on, uh, hopefully we mm -hmm. are able to go on some trips in the future here yeah. uh, with, with the coronavirus. But, um, you know, if you do get a chance to, to go on one of our trips in the future, what, what do you think the, from your lens is the, the most important thing when it comes to, uh, our mission, you know, obviously we go into these communities where sometimes kids are, are getting a baseball or a softball, for the first time and, right. and, and they're, they're really just getting the basics mm -hmm. right, right there in front of them. So what, uh, what would you say is, is the most important thing that you would want to instill in them? I think, I think them understanding that um, it's not an easy game. 
um, having played it, but it can be so much fun. And, you know, to have fun with the game and enjoy it, um, you know, I think we lose sight of that, especially at the pro level again. It's a job, you know, but it's so much fun with these kids. And, then, you know, like I said, see some of them that haven't really played before and see their joy in their faces being able to do something that they've never done before. It was awesome. Yeah, that I mean, it's certainly incredible to see the the looks on their faces. And and uh, I tell this story all the time, but I was talking to one of the principals of a school in Puerto Rico that we went and served mm-hmm. two years ago. And uh, she told me that she lets the kids wear the, the Baseball Miracles T-shirts to the school as a, I guess, a Friday dress code, so to speak. So ah. very, very neat stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, uh, Willie, we'll, we'll shift now to your career in baseball, mm-hmm. 1985, 15, 15th overall selection in 1985. Now I hadn't done much research prior to this on the 1985 draft, but it was a pretty darn good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at some of the names, uh, mm-hmm. obviously yourself uh, and the likes of Randy Johnson, Barry Bonds, uh, what do you remember about draft day for you in 1985? So, uh, you know, I had talked to um, at least 10 or 11 clubs and and it was, um, I remember I talked to Cincinnati. I knew that we knew that the Brewers were going to pick first and that was BJ Serhoff. And then it was Will Clark and then Bobby Witt. Um, and then it was four. Uh, Cincinnati was at four, I think. And Pittsburgh was at six. And yep. Right. And yeah, then yeah. Uh, so Larkin, I don't remember who was fifth. Then Bonds was sixth. Kurt Brown was fifth. Kurt Brown. Okay. And yep. Barry, Barry Bonds was sixth. And then um, Inky was in there. St. Cavillia was taken by Montreal, I believe, somewhere in there, right? Eighth. Eighth, right. And then, I don't know, Tommy Green or somebody like that, nine. And then Walt Weiss was 11. Uh, and so Walt Weiss lived about 40 minutes away from me. And B.J. Serhoff lived about 50 minutes away from me. So I was talking to Walter, and I saw him get picked 11. I had no idea that the Angels – I met the Angels one time. I talked to Pittsburgh, I talked to Cleveland, I talked to Cincinnati, and I'm like, the Angels drafted me. It was, it was, um, it was crazy, you know, you just sit there, because there was no internet, I mean, it was just a phone call, and you don't, you don't know what's going on, there was no, nobody was doing it on the radio or anything else, it was just like, yeah, you got a phone call, you drafted by the Angels in 15th pick, I was like, <laughs> it was wild, it was, it was, uh, it was great, and, and just the, just a chance to get to live your dream. You know, that was, that was awesome. So you didn't expect to get picked around I, that time? I, I felt like as many teams as I had spoken to, I felt like I was going to go in the first round. I just didn't know when. Um, but, um, and then years later on, I met, um, I met a couple of scouts and one of the guys from uh, Kansas city, he told me if you didn't get picked by the angels, they would pick next. And I think it was Brian McCray. They took, um like 16 or 17 right 17th 17 yeah he goes you were glad i have this up (laughs) (laughs) but i mean rafael palmero's in that draft um in like 23rd by the cubs or something like that um there was some mark grace mark grace is like 14th round you know good draft and and it amazes me that like brandy johnson was a second round pick yeah yeah wow yeah I mean, and it was, and when, what I remember about that was Randy, you know, hard, but wild. It was wild, you know, and then they, they got it roped in where he could throw it over and then it was Hall of Fame. <laughs> what was, uh, what was the scouting report on Willie Fraser as a pitcher back in the day? So I was different gun, different times. Um, I was like, I sat at like 92, 93 on the Ray gun, pitched at in that range. I topped out at 95. And then um, I had a slider, but I had a fork ball. And that was different than a lot of guys. So, and in college, we used a diamond baseball, which was like throwing a golf ball. So my, my hands are pretty big. So it was easy for me to grab a hold of it and I could make it like, it was like a wiffle ball at times. It was great. So that was, I think that was one of the deciding factors of why I got taken because 
I did well my junior year, but I was at a division two. My, my whole college was less than 500 students. Wow. So, and we've, we had five guys playing the big leagues from that school. This is Concordia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah myself. Well, Dell Austin was the first, then myself, um, Scott Leas from the twins, John Darty, um, Tigers, and then Mike Abias. So from a little school, it was, it was uh, pretty cool. That's, that is amazing. Uh, really, that, that's really cool stuff. So want to backtrack just for a second. Yeah. How long did you live in Newburgh before you moved on? Did you, did you grow up there the I, your enti- yeah, yeah. entire My, life through 18 years old? Yeah, I was there until I was 21, and then I got when I got drafted, I, I went back that for after my first um, half season of pro ball, um, and then the next winter I moved out to um, California. Gotcha. And so you played with like like I mentioned, you were drafted by the California Angels. You also played with the Toronto Blue Jays. This is at the major league level: the Blue Jays, the Cardinals, the Marlins, uh, and the Expos mm-hmm. at the big league level. What stood out to you the most about your career at the big league level? Um, I think the, the couple of things I'm, I'm most proud of. I played for 15 years professionally total, and I never spent a day on a stable list as a pitcher. So, I mean, it was – and it wasn't always because I was always healthy. It was just that I just couldn't afford to get hurt because <laughs> there were guys behind me, and I knew it. So um, – and I was able to transition and I went from starter to reliever and it was a little rocky in the beginning, but, um, but I felt like I turned the corner after a while where I had figured it out. Um, and I got to the big leagues, I got drafted in 85 and I was, in, I was in the big leagues in 86. So it was pretty fast nice from 40 to the big leagues. Very cool. You know, what, what was the, the best team that you, that you were on during your career in the big leagues? Well, the Blue Jays were a pretty good club. I mean, they, that was 91. They won the World Series, I think, in 93. Um, but, I mean, we had we had Olerud at first, Alomar at second, um, Kelly Gruber's at third. Um, we had Devon White in center field, Joe Carter in right field. Um, and then you had Glenn Allen Hill and Mark Witten. Um, and then Pat Borders and Greg Myers, Dave Steve, Jimmy Key. Hankin um, had just come up to the big leagues. Um, and then you had Hanky and Ward in the bullpen. David Wells was in the bullpen. Uh, so it was a pretty stout club. Yeah. You know, there was, it was a pretty good club. I mean, I felt like um, the Angels, the Angel clubs that I played on. So I got to the big leagues in 86, and that's when they played the Red Sox in, in the league championship. And, um, and Dave Henderson hit the homer off of Donnie Moore. Mm. And then the Red Sox went on to play against the Mets and then the Mets beat them in the World Series. So um, I was a little bit part of that. I got one game in big leagues then. So, but um, that was a pretty good club. I mean, it was getting to the big leagues and and I'm playing with Reggie Jackson and Bob Boone and Bobby Gritch and guys that I had watched growing up. Now I'm on their same team with those guys. That was, that was awesome. I mean, Reggie Jackson, that's, (laughs) that's a household name right there. I Mm -hmm. mean, you, so you only spent what a, a year in the minors before 86 came around when you were in the big leagues. That's a pretty rapid turnaround there. Yeah, I went, I was, um, I played in low a ball in quad cities, Iowa, my first full season, my first half season. And then I went to Palm Springs. I spent four months there and then um, I got called up to triple a spent a month in triple a. And then I got to the big leagues at, in, at the end of the year. So, what can you tell us about what it was like being a teammate of Reggie Jackson? Um, You know, being a teammate, I I was fortunate. Chuck Finley had gotten to the big leagues quicker than I did. Um, Finley and I got drafted the same year. He was a January draft when they used to have that. And he was in the big leagues in May. So when I got there, him and I were pretty good friends already. And it's like, he said, just don't say a word. Just be quiet, sit in your locker. If they start, they start be ragging on you a little bit. Just let it go because they will kill you as a group. They'll kill you, and it was it was cool to see just how they focused when it was t- game time. They could fool around and jerk around, but as soon as the bell rang, it was on, and you know it was a, a different switch. 
and to sit there and watch that, I was like, how do they do that? Like, you know, Chuck Finley was probably one of the best I'd ever seen at it. He could be in the middle of a joke on the mound pitching. He'd come in the dugout, start telling a joke, stop, go out and pitch an inning, come back in and finish the joke, pick up right where he left off. I'm like, how do you do that? You know, yeah. it was just wild. I mean, they, they just, those guys have an ability to, to flip a switch. That is, that's crazy. That's, yeah. I mean, that's a, a different type of specimen right there. Really, really right. impressive. Willie, what was the best? I know this is a tough question. I'm just going to uh-huh. throw this out there. It is tough. Is there one game where you sit back and say that one, that was the best game I ever pitched? What sure. was it? Uh, can I use three different games? Is that all right? That's all right. yeah. That's what that's what oh. we're here for. All okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, growing up in New York, I was um, all of my friends were Yankee fans, and so I was not going to be a Yankee fan because I didn't want to be just a Yankee fan. So I was a Red Sox fan, which really pissed people off, of course. But that's okay. Um, so my first complete game in the big leagues was at Fenway against the Red Sox. And it was, you know, it was Jim Rice. It was Dewey Evans. It was, I mean, it was guys that, again, I grew up watching and now I'm pitching against them in Fenway. So that was in 87. That was the first one. And then I threw a shutout in Kansas city, which just was, I mean, in my mind, I go back to that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I'm thinking about things, because it was the ninth inning and I had a four nothing lead and George Brett comes up and I'd gotten him out twice and he hits a ball that hit the top of the fence in center field, dead center. And it bounced back in for a double. And I was like, Oh, thank the Lord. <laughs> and I was able to get the next guy out and got out of the game and, and won the game. So wow. that was pretty cool. And then, um, and then I, I had, um, I threw a one hitter against the Mariners in 88. Um, I gave up a home run in the seventh inning of a of a two to nothing game, and um, that was the only hit I gave up the whole game. So we won two to one. So wow, I mean that's cool. that's that's pretty darn close to a no hitter. Yeah. I, yeah, I man, that's 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 impressive. How about the the toughest hitter you ever faced in the big leagues? Um, well, that list is really long. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, no, you, you were, but you shoved. You were when you were on the mound. It was. I had my moments. Out. Yeah, I had my moments. Um, <laughs> you know, Boggs beat me up pretty good. Um, not so much power, but he did hit a couple home runs off me. Um, Mattingly hurt me bad. Winfield crushed me. Um, Winfield did the monuments off me. I mean, it was just they just beat the hell out of me sometimes. But you know, I mean, I I held my own against other guys like Kirby Puckett. I I could. I pitched well against Kirby. I don't know why. Um, you know, different guys. McGuire didn't really hurt me too bad, um, but Canseco did. So just and then I would get beat by Greg Gagne. Like every game I pitched, he would hit some hard with two guys on and driving runs. And I'm like, you have to get him out. And I just he would beat me. I mean, it was just kind of he saw me on the mound. And he was confident. You know, same thing when you see a guy in the box and you know. He didn't. I got him. It's a cool feeling. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and now uh, you are, and I meant to mention this at the top, but um, you're net. You're you're a scout for yep. the Chicago Cubs. Correct. How long have you been in this role with the Chicago Chicago Cubs? So this is this will be my um, this is going on my third year. Starting in November, it'll be my third year with them. Um, but I've been so this is my. This will be my 38th year starting next year in pro ball. So 15 of it where it's playing and then uh, jumped into this, this side. And uh, it's been, it's been an interesting ride. It was really cool when I first started and now it's getting harder and harder because things are changing so fast. And with the COVID thing, it's making it even harder. Is it, I mean, we'll get to COVID in just a second, but before COVID, I mean, thing mm-hmm. you said things are changing. Is it social media, like trying to keep up with the times? I mean, I have trouble sometimes keeping up with the the most recent updates on my phone, just trying to figure out the best way to to engage right. with different people. What is what has been the biggest challenge being a scout I, over the years? I, I think that it used to be where when I first started, 
your opinion was your opinion and then you just did it the way you did it. Um, so I would watch a game and I would write up the players and what I saw from them and where I saw, thought they fit. And then as the, as the saber metrics and everything else came into play, different organizations would force you to learn it. And I didn't go to school for that. I went to school to play baseball and I knew what that looked like, but I didn't go to RA. I didn't go to, you know, any of those schools to learn that. And so having to learn that was, was tough. I mean, and I, I, I'm far away from learning, understanding it completely, but I can look at it and understand what's going on. But um, it's just been, a, it's been a tough transition and I can see why, you know, some guys have run it, got run out because it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. You know, we, they expect us to do both in some instances. The Cubs have been great. They said, look, I just want you to watch the game and tell me what you see. Yeah. Don't worry. You want to use that? Use it. If you don't want to use it, don't use it. I want to know what you see. So, you know, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, that's, that's great to hear. And, and this year has been challenging for many reasons uh, yeah. for many different people for you personally, mm -hmm. how have you handled 2020? Um, so like everybody else in, in pro baseball, I mean, I went to spring training, everything was normal um, and started scouting. And the next thing I knew it was the 13th of, March and we were going home. We were done. Um, and then we really didn't do anything. We had to write up some of the guys that we saw in spring training, but it was really nothing for us to do because there was nothing going on. We hadn't seen enough games to do anything. So when they finally started, well, they, they, they kind of started giving us some stuff like go watch Japanese games on video. So we would write up Japanese players. And then that moved into we started playing here and then we and then everybody had organizations we had to write up so and I do with the clubs we had this is a couple different clubs so you know you'll get it was more than enough work to do uh -huh. um in their mind and, and they're still working us now so i mean in which i understand it's what they want so you know you do it but watching the game on video is not not even close to the same as being in the ballpark it's just not the same feel and not only is it not the same feel, but I can imagine it's it's more challenging to scout, right, when it comes to trying to decipher who's got potential here, who's got potential there, right? Or is it not that hard? Oh, no, no, no. It's a lot harder because you don't see – I think you, I think you get lost because you only see what the camera allows you to see. So, you know, when, when you're evaluating a guy, you just don't watch their at-bat only. You watch what they do in the field. You watch how they act in the in the dugout, how they interact with their teammates. You know what they do in batting practice before, how hard they work at it. So, when you lose all that, you're just watching what the camera shows you now. So you might not see a defensive play in five games, but you have to write up his defense. And I'm like, right. where am I supposed to get that? I don't understand where you're allowed to get it. I can't see it. So it, it definitely becomes challenging, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, no, I, and and hopefully we get to a point where yeah it's a lot it's a lot better um but Willie, i i, I appreciate you taking some time to to join oh, me for the spotlight series it was it was really interesting to see some of the or hear some of the things that you had to share as far as your your career goes some of the the players that you played with mm -hmm. uh, and and just being a part of of baseball for for quite some time the fact that you did not go on the disabled list in 15 years mm -hmm. is it's tremendous. I mean, that yeah. is, that's crazy. Do you ever think back about that and say, how in the world did I do that? Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, I, and I know that a lot of it's luck, a lot of it's luck. I mean, you're not going to sit there and, 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 and my mechanics were good enough to where I could repeat them enough. It, it, I thought my delivery was fine. Um, but, you have to be lucky too. I mean, you know, I mean, there were times where I was hurt, but not enough to where I couldn't get it going to, to pitch. So, I mean, it was funny when you, you talk about Reggie Jackson and, and, you know, when, when I came up, it was um, go in the training room to get ice after you throw. And he'd say, um, what are you doing in here? I was just going to get some ice in my arm. He goes, ice is for drinks. It's not for your arm. Get out. <laughs> wait Re reggie jackson told you this yeah yeah 
That is so you turn around and get out is what you do and then deal with it later. So, I mean, it was, um, but you just kind of figured out a way to do it. I mean, unless something was really bad, you know, that you couldn't pick up your arm. I mean, I didn't have that problem. I could get it going. It just wasn't always the best, but right. Figured it out. Amazing. So didn't, didn't go on the DL. You, you got this magical fork ball, right? <laughs> Very, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think we necessarily see that too often, right? A fork ball these days? No, or? no. Yeah, it was a, that was like the time of it was a split. Yeah. Um, but my fingers were bigger and I could get deeper on the ball. So I was, I could do that. Um, velocity wise, it was like 83, 84 ish. So, and it had some, when it was thrown correctly, which wasn't always, but when it was, it had some tumble to it and, you know, get some swings over the top of it. Great. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's awesome. Well, yeah. Willie, Willie, we really appreciate you taking some time to, to chat. Thank you for your support to the Baseball Miracles organization. We, we really appreciate that. And uh, hopefully we can get you on, on a trip in the near future and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and continue to, to do what we do, serve the, the uh, impoverished youth across the world through baseball and softball. So thanks for coming on and thank you for sharing some of your stories from your, your big league career and, and uh, I'm glad to hear that that all is well. By the yeah. way, how long are you how long are you going with this scouting thing? Well, as long as they'll keep me. I mean, I'm fine. Uh, you know, yeah. um, especially being home this year, this summer for the first time in so long. Um, in fact, I've got to go out on Tuesday. I'm um, getting to go to Florida for ten days, which I'm sure my wife's more happy than I am about it. But that's you know, I understand that. Um, we finally we have five kids, and they're they're all out. So. It's her and I now, and uh, so I'm sure she's anxious for me to leave because she's used to me leaving. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Willie, thanks for coming on the, the Spotlight Series. Uh, we look forward to to seeing you at one of our events in the, in the near future. But until then, take care of yourself and your family, and uh, we wish you nothing but the best. Sam, I want to thank you and, um, and everybody at Baseball Miracles. I mean, it's a great organization. I'm proud to be a part of it. The little part I am, but I'm proud to be a part of it. And I think um, you guys have done great things and will continue to do great things and uh, with everyone you get in touch with. I thank you very much.